from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. So good afternoon. I'm Jennifer Harpster, a reference and research specialist with the Science, Technology, and Business Division here at the Library of Congress. I'd like to welcome you to today's program, How to Manage a Satellite Going 17,000 Miles Per Hour, the Historic Flight of Landsat 5. This program is the second in, a, in our 2013 series, presented through a partnership between our division and NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center. And I'd also like to remind you that our next lecture in June will feature astrobiologist Avi Mandel talking about exotic Earths and exploring planets from, other, um, from around other stars. I'm absolutely delighted to introduce today's speaker today, Steve Covington. He's the Flight Systems Manager for Landsat 5 and 7 for the USGS Earth, Earth Resource Observation and Science Center, or EROS in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, and he's also the Systems Director at the Aerospace Corps Corporation. I've been excited about this lecture ever since we began planning it last year. I am in awe of Steve, one of the best engineers in this country, and his world-class team who can manage an object that's moving tens of thousands of miles an hour through fields of space debris, 400, 440 miles above Earth? 438. Okay, 438 <laughs> miles above Earth, and at the same time, um, ab he's able to keep the systems healthy and in check. Um, when I have the hardest time maneuvering through traffic and potholes through the D.C. streets. Um, so I am in on that. Steve started his career at, at Eros in the middle of a cornfield on South in South Dakota. He remembers watching the launch of Landsat 5 on closed circuit TV in 1994. 1984, sorry, not realizing the role it would play in his future. After several more years at Eros, Steve moved east and spent time working at the production, as the production director for a French satellite company's U.S. division. Then in 1995, Steve got back to his roots, so to speak, and began working at the Aerospace Corporation on contract to the USGS, first as the liaison between the USGS and NASA, during the development and launch of the Landsat 7 mission, and then as a Landsat 7 flight systems manager. In 2001, he landed Landsat 5. He landed. He added. <laughs> landed. <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> he added Landsat 5 to his portfolio and has become the longest running flight manager in its 29 year history. Landsat 5 was launched on March 1st, 1984, with the expectancy of three years design life, and with the hope it would collect Earth observations for at least five more years. 29 years and a Guinness Book of World Records award later, Landsat 5 is just now ending its historic flight after firmly establishing itself as the grand dame of remote sensing, setting a standard of productivity and discovery that future missions will be building upon for decades to come. Steve is going to share with us the remarkable story of this mission, explaining how these Earth observing missions are operated and telling the inspirational story of how the flight operations team on ground used equal parts engineering, determination, and luck to propel Landsat 5 into the record books. So please join me in welcoming Steve Covington to the Library of Congress. Thank you, Jennifer. Hi, everybody. Again, Steve Covington. And I'm here today to talk to you a bit about how it is to fly a satellite around the globe. And just as a little way of context to this, I also teach a course called Space Systems Overview for the Aerospace Corporation, which is a uh, course that will cover many of the same topics, that covers many of the same topics that I'll be talking with you here today. The difference is that course I teach over a two-day period, and the biggest complaint I get from the students is that it's like being fed through a fire hose. I've got about 45 minutes to give you that same information today. So uh, I'll be traveling fairly fast, almost as fast as Landsat 5, uh, to try to uh, give you an idea of what it takes to fly the mission. And uh, 
and I'm going to be using Landsat 5 to do that because that'll help me illustrate the concepts. It does it lets me do that, but also it lets me tell you the story, the really unbelievably fantastic story, the highlight of my career uh, of, of uh, that, this mission, uh, the little satellite that could and did and continues to this day. I'll just, uh, I'm going to give you a really quick brief aside. We're in the process right now of decommissioning that satellite. It was launched in 1984 with a certain amount of fuel. That's a consumable on board. And we can't seem to get it to run out of fuel. Uh, I, <laughs> yesterday was our third, well, we've, we've done 10 maneuvers to decommissioning the, the satellite. And uh, uh, regrettably for me and my reputation with, spy, with uh, the US Geological Survey, yesterday was the third time I predicted we'd run out of fuel. And yesterday for the third time, Landsat 5 proved me wrong. And now we have another maneuver on Friday to still try to empty the tanks. So it's, uh, it's an, a remarkable satellite. It is completely in keeping with how the satellite has, has worked so hard to continue flying throughout its mission. So uh, what I'm going to start with, though, is telling you, OK, what the heck is Landsat 5 and what is the Landsat program? So this is just a, I'm going to have a little brief aside before we get into how we fly the satellites to tell you what are the satellites that we're flying. So the Landsat mission timeline, uh, what you're seeing here, I'll try not to shoot myself. What you're seeing here is a whole series of satellites. Landsat 5, obviously, is number 5. Landsat 1 actually launched in 1972. Landsat 8, the most recent satellite, uh, was launched in February of this year. And actually, next week, I'll be out in South Dakota for its grand commissioning. Uh, and it goes into operation uh, next Friday, actually. We have uh, reviews on Thursday. And then it uh, goes transitions from NASA development to US Geological Survey operations next Friday. So that's a very exciting time for us. We've got a couple reviews uh, that will all turn out fine. And uh, we'll be transitioning that from NASA to US Geological Survey. Really, the, the one point I'll make here is that all these lines, there's, for every new satellite, the next one follows soon, you know, before the end of the uh, demise of the previous one. That's important, and that's a, that's a key factor in the Landsat program that everyone has to understand, because I'll be talking a bit more about it as we talk about why we fly it the way we do. Continuity, observational continuity. A key factor for these missions, these are satellites that take pictures of the Earth. They, they don't take pictures of... of, of, of uh, license plates. Uh, they don't take pictures of clouds. They pick, take pictures of the land for resource management, for disaster monitoring responses. Uh, I'm going to show you a couple pictures coming up here, uh, just as a little eye candy. But the, uh, but the main point here is that we have to always have the next satellite up before the previous one fails. That's critical because if we don't, then we lose that link of observational continuity. The satellite's orbiting the Earth seven, 14 and a half times a day, taking images on every single orbit. And these images all have to fit together with the images taken the, and the previous time that piece of land was collected back through time. And, uh, and the observational continuity is key. Another piece of the continuity, and I'm just going to speak briefly on this, is how we build the satellites. NASA has always been at the heart of building these Landsat satellites. I, I will give uh, a shout out to the U.S. Geological Survey and Department of Interior, who back in, in 1966, actually, first came up with the concept of a Earth orbiting resource satellite, uh, which then uh, Johnson administration, I think, said, yeah, I think we'll have NASA build that, uh, which was probably not a bad idea. Um, so NASA built the first satellite, actually called ERTS, one, Earth Resource Technology Satellite, uh, and then aptly renamed Landsat after its launch. Re Earth's one, two, and three, Landsat's one, two, and three, through the 70s, Landsat's four and five. Landsat six, actually, we'll talk about a little bit later, but uh, did not achieve all the, all the successes that we'd hoped for because it never really achieved orbit, and I'll talk briefly to that later. Uh, Landsat five launched in 84, it's continuing, actually, Unfortunately, to this day still, uh, not till yesterday, but to today, uh, that's still flying. But then we launched Landsat 7 in 1999, and uh, this is a tad out of date, but we have now launched Landsat 8. It's called the, Land, uh, the Landsat Data Continuity Mission. Up until next week, when it go, turns operational, it gets renamed from Landsat Data Continuity Mission to Landsat 8, and it's officially in operation. Another constant through this whole thing has been Department of Interior and the U.S. Geological Survey. They, right from the beginning, were a part of the Landsat program. 
uh, up through 99 in 2000, they played a ground system role where they were the land archive, the land remote sensing archive for the nation. They have uh, always stored the deep archived, the Landsat data, and then cr uh, created products that were distributed to the public. And to this day, if you go to their website, any image that Landsat's ever collected back to 1972, you can go to that website today and download images at no cost. Uh, anyone in the world can. It's that's uh, it's another amazing fact of Landsat, the Landsat program, is that it's. It's an international program, really. It's the it's its reach has been international. There isn't a corner of this world that Lancet has not played a role in. And moving on to to that, let's take a little bit of the eye candy. Uh, flooding in the Mississippi River in 2011. Uh, Lancet data was there to to record the the um, to record the uh, flooding of the river and the extent of that damage. And not only that, but again, because of observational continuity. Not only in this image can you see where the water was, but on the, uh, this is where the flooding was. But if you go back in time, you can see what was underneath it. Because from an insurance standpoint, it's not only where is the water, but what was underneath the water. Uh, what got flooded, you know, what was fallow field, what was an active agricultural field, what was someone's home. So that's the type of thing that you can get from Landsat data. This is actually something I uh, co-wrote a paper on back in 1986, and that is the fact that Landsat, Five, Landsat 5 was the first satellite to actually image and confirm to the world the, nu the uh, nuclear disaster at Chernobyl. The, this is when it was being produced back in the, uh, the, um, in the 70s. When it was, this is the day, this is the first image taken, and unfortunately I didn't create a zoom up for you, but if you looked at it, there's actually a little red dot where, this, where the uh, core of the, of the reactor was on fire. And then post uh, uh, the, post the uh, disaster, all these fields that were actively being uh, used are now all fallow. They're all growing in over time uh, because no one grows anything anymore. No one lives there anymore. Okay, another important point of all this observational continuity uh, is not only to see what's happening now, but any picture has value in and of itself, but it takes on enormously more value if you can tell what was happening before that. So we can look at land cover, land use today, but we're informed by knowing what the land use land cover was before so that we can deduce land cover change, land use change. And the Chesapeake Bay region, which many of you are aware of, all the reclamation going on and renewal of that whole watershed, decisions have been made over the last 30 years on how to clean up the bay. And Landsat 5 has been there through this entire period, taking pictures back in the 70s and 80s and 90s through the Landsat program of what was wrong with it. And decisions are made, policies are made by, by federal, state, and local governments. And by taking continued images into the future, we can look at the cause and effect of those policies. So again, a place where uh, Landsat has made a real difference. I put this up because this is just iconic. Uh, deforestation around the world. Everyone's aware of the deforestation, and especially in the uh, rainforests of the Amazon and in Congo. Well, this is in Bolivia, as it, as it turns out. And, and I'm Got to move along, but let me just say, the role Landsat's played here is probably incalculable because it brought to attention the world through vivid pictures the the forests that were there and how they've been how they were uh, deforested and used for logging and then for agriculture. And, and in fact, because of that, if you look at the uh, if you go to the FAO and look at the their website, the Deforestation, rate of deforestation in the globe, around the world, has actually decreased in the 2000 uh, decade from what it was in previous decades. And that's because of what Landsat's been able to do to bring to the forefront this issue and help put pressure and, and smarter tactics on how to do land use to all these different countries around the world. I've got Lake Chad up here uh, from three different time periods, basically showing uh, how it was drying up over time, how large it used to be and how small it has gotten. But that's not why I have this picture up here. I have it up here to remind me of something that I uh, actually took part of in the 80s, and that is a humanitarian effort that Landsat 5 uh, participated in. If you'll recall back in the 80s, for those of us who were there, uh, that there, were, uh, there was a, a, a literally a, a continent-wide drought going on in Africa, and there were many relief projects trying to bring food and water and, and, and resources to all the people of Africa that were really having problems. Well, the relief workers ran into a very unique problem. 
The wells are drying up in the villages, so the villagers actually traveled away from their villages trying to, in search of water so that they could survive. Well, so then when the relief workers would take the grain to these villages, no one was there. They didn't know where these villagers had gone because there wasn't that communication to really let us know that. So someone had the bright idea, not me, unfortunately, uh, of saying, let's use Landsat 5 data that, that can cover the continent with imagery. In a 1680 period, we can cover the entire continent and use special image processing techniques to find where the water is. If we can find where the water is, we'll be able to find where the people are, because they're off looking for that water. And in fact, that's exactly what was done. They, they found where the water was, they vectored their C-130 cargo planes with the grain to where they found water. They looked down, if they found people, they pushed grain out the, out the plane. And that saved millions of people during that decade. So uh, that's just one other great story that Landsat 5 was key front and center to, to the world history. Okay, so that's enough about the high candy and, and what the Landsat program is. Sorry, Mike. <clears throat> <laughs> now we're going to talk about the satellite itself. So, again, it was launched on March 1st, 1984. On that day, I was in a conference room in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, at the Earth Resource Observations Data Center, the Aero Center, which they love that name. Aeros love. Anyway. <clears throat> but I'm being a little rim tap. Anyway. I was in a conference room on that day watching the launch of Landsat 5 via closed circuit TV. Uh, it was very exciting, mainly because I was this young engineer and wow, look at this rocket science. I, I was there as a photographic engineer working on aerial films and, uh, and so satellites seemed like this really cool thing to me. And, and in fact, I had no idea back then that I'd still be talking about Landsat 5 29 years later and in fact that I'd be the mission director, the flight systems manager for that mission uh, actually for about over a decade. So it's been a really great honor for me. But let's get to the pictures themselves and what's happening. There, those, that's a Delta II, which is what launched, uh, a Delta II rocket is what launched Landsat 5. And, and a lot of power going in through there. And why is it there? Because you've got to escape Earth's gravity. Uh, the, you know, this is where we get to the 17,000 miles an hour portion of this talk. You have to escape the Earth's gravity, or not escape it completely, but you have to you know, harness the Earth's gravity to be a satellite in orbit. If you go too slow, you'll re-enter the atmosphere. If you go too fast, you do escape Earth's gravity, and, and off you go, and, and then you, you're on your way to Mars, <laughs> which we didn't want to do with any of the Landsat missions. Well, but let's talk a little bit about that. Landsat 6, that's a mission that did not make it to full orbit. Why? Because the rocket took it up. It got up to almost 705 kilometers, our operating altitude, but we had some problems with the attitude systems on the spacecraft, and so when it came time to accelerate it to the full 17,000 miles an hour, it didn't do it. It didn't happen. And so it tumbled and it never got, it never got the critical speed necessary to, to balance with the Earth's uh, gravitational pull. And so the Earth's gravitational pull pulled it back down. It went only went a couple orbits and then it was down, we believe, in the Pacific. Now it's not a, not a land imaging system, it's a bathymetric sensor. <laughs> Water for those. <laughs> So anyway, yeah, that uh, ended up in the Pacific or Indian Ocean. I believe we, we thought it was the Indian Ocean. Uh, so that was unfortunate. And, and, and you know, we make light of it now. We can through the lens of time. But the, the, the fact is it was a critical loss because in 1993 when that happened, this three-year design life mission was already long in the tooth at, at nine years old. And so we needed that mission to make ensure that we had uh, that observational continuity. Unfortunately, we lost that mission. And so it's gone. Uh, luckily, Landsat 5 persevered and pushed on well to the launch of Landsat 7 and, and beyond, Landsat 8. So, let's talk a little bit about that observational continuity. And let me not push this, let me push this. There we go. Okay. What you see here is a, is a map of the, the world, and you can, you can see the, the geography impaired. There's the U.S., South America, and and all these red lines represent the ground track of the Landsat satellite. There are actually, if the red lines aren't on every ground track, but they're every, I think, 10 ground tracks. There are actually 233 individual ground tracks that the spacecraft rolls over to in, order, in order to cover the entire globe. Each one of those ground tracks, between going down the daylight side and up the, the dark side, have 248 scenes. That's actually almost 60,000, 57,000 some odd individual scene centers that uh, that the satellite can take pictures of. That this is called a reference system. And the reason we have that is because if I want to take a picture of Sioux, South, Sioux Falls, South Dakota, that is not at, 
you know, you don't say, I want to take a picture of Sioux Falls, South Dakota. You say, I want path row 3132, and that's Sioux Falls, South Dakota. And that way, and by the way, for the record, it's not 3132. I'd have to look that up. Uh, <laughs> but, but you take that path row, and that's what you would reference. And that's why you have the road reference system. And it's important because that carries on not just for Landsat 5. The road reference system 2 began with Landsat 4 and continues through Landsat 8. So we'll have that from 1982 to, the, to at least the demise of Landsat 8, which isn't expected for at least 10 to 15 years. So that's a, another long period of time where we can use this reference system to figure out where we are. Again, part of the observational continuity. We need to be able to uh, take pictures at the same point at the, sa uh, at the same time. So observational continuity, I just mentioned both aspects of it that we we're concerned with. Location, which this road ride reference system handles, but then there's time. You can't take a picture of Washington, D.C. today at 10 o'clock in the morning and take another one 16 days from now at 6 o'clock in the evening and make any scientific comparison uh, of the radiometry, uh, the, 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 the picture itself, uh, because you've just, you've just taken that picture with two completely different uh, solar uh, environments. One was taken at 10 o'clock in the morning, the other one 6 p.m. in the evening. The light is completely different. It's coming from different angles. If you take it, and so what we need to do for observational continuity is always take a picture at the same time every time. So the picture, we don't, we don't have to be flying over, land, uh, over Washington, D.C. today, but if we were taking a picture today, we, uh, the one we took 16 days ago would look exactly the same, be taken at the same exact time. And in fact, the picture with Landsat 5 that we took 16 years ago would be taken at the same exact time. That, that, that solar illumination and keeping that consistent, that's a key part of the science of, of observation and change detection. And so that's, a, that's the key, two key points that we're going to talk about when we talk about the orbit is maintaining our mean local time, the time that we cross the equator every single orbit, and uh, our, our ground track staying on those lines. You can't deviate from those lines because, again, if you deviate from that line, then you're, if you move your scene center from... Washington DC over to Ocean City, then the illumination, the, the, the bidirectional reflectance, the, the illumination, the angle that the sunlight hits at would be different. And that's a bad thing for, for observational continuity. Okay, so let's got a little video here that will help make this a little easier to see. If I can find that, there we go. I'm a PC guy, so this is a Mac. <laughs> Voila. Okay, so this helps put it in a little bit of perspective of exactly how our, our concept of operations works for Landsat. So here you have that WRS. Now you see it's laid out upon the uh, glo spinning globe. So you're the sun. Sorry again, Mike. You're the sun, and you're looking at the Earth. It's 10 a.m., and the, and the satellite's going to be going uh, operating by orbiting around the Earth and taking pictures. So as it's traveling over land, it's taking pictures. Now I will mentioned this is actually Landsat 8. This is a this is a video done for Landsat 8, the mission that just launched this year. But the concept of operations is the same. Again, observational continuity. We operate Landsat 8 the same way Landsat 7 and 5 and 4 have been operated for that observational continuity. Now we don't actually image over the water, we only image over the land. And so 14 and a half times a day we orbit the Earth and we collect all those pictures. So this this is the represents the one day of imaging that we would collect. But then there's day two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 16 days. To cover all 300, 233 rows of imagery, we actually, it actually takes us 16 days. And so this is showing how it covers in and we fill in the gaps so that by the end of the 16 days, we've, we've taken an image over the entire globe. Well, we've, we've, we've flown over the entire globe. The spacecraft themselves don't have the capability to collect every single image, every piece of ground. There are, there are constraints on how much data that would be. There's constraints on how much data we can actually uh, send to the ground. And there are, there are technical issues, such as the instruments on board can overheat. And so we have to, there's what we call duty cycle. You can run them so long before you have to let them cool off. And, and so we aren't able to actually collect every single image that uh, we fly over. So we'll talk about that a little bit later about how do we decide what images we do collect. Okay, so I told you that we have to worry about the ground track, keeping that the same, and we also have to worry about the, uh, the inclination, the keeping the mean local time where it needs to be. So we're gonna talk about uh, ground track first, and we control the ground track with 
the orbit the altitude that we fly at. Seems hmm, that's kind of odd, but but it's true because we want the satellite. And by the way, you can ooh and out the graphics all you want. I did these last weekend. Uh, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so there we are, orbiting around the Earth. Uh, not quite that way, because the, the satellite's actually pitching over the Earth. It wasn't that good a, of an of a, uh, animation. But uh, so we're orbiting around the Earth, and we orbit at a very particular speed, at a very particular altitude. Why? Because that makes an orbit period, it takes 98 and a half minutes, just about, for us to orbit the globe completely. So when we cross the equator, it's 98 and a half minutes, to get back to that equator again. And we maintain that time to within a second. And we have to. Why? Because we, for us to stay in that ground track, we're not rotating around the Earth. The Earth is rotating underneath us. The, the spacecraft is always at, flying in the same path, and the Earth has to rotate underneath it. And we want the Earth to rotate 24.62 degrees every time we orbit. Well, guess what? It takes about 90, 90 and a half minutes for the Earth to rotate 24.62 degrees. And so that's what's happening. It's as we ro rotate around the Earth, the Earth rotates underneath us and goes 24.62 degree, uh, degrees of rotation in that, uh, in, in that 98 and a half minute orbit period. So what happens if, if, we go, if we slow down, and we do slow down, and let me tell you why, drag, environment, the atmospheric drag, the same thing that when you stick your hand out the window of your car and it pushes you back, we actually have that at 705 kilometers, believe it or not. Not a lot of it. There are very few, few molecules of atmosphere up that high. But when you're traveling 17,000 miles an hour, it doesn't take a lot of molecule, molecules to add up and start pushing you back. That's removing energy from your orbit and making you go lower. And when you go lower, this button does nothing. When you go lower... <laughs> The satellite goes lower. So it, it, I'm sorry, I meant to change this. Minus delta v, delta velocity. Um, Here oh, that light. Thank you very much. Oh, the other other button. Two buttons on it. So when when we go slower, there's less energy in the orbit, and the the circumference of the orbit is smaller. And what that means is that we actually orbit the Earth faster. So what happens is we orbit faster, so the Earth doesn't have an opportunity to go 24.62 degrees. It doesn't get to rotate as far as it needs to, and so we start going off a ground track. Likewise, if we have too much energy in the, uh, in the orbit, if we're too high, it's a larger circumference, it actually takes longer for the satellite to go around, and now the Earth has a chance to rotate too far. In both cases, bad, bad, because that means we're, rotate, we're, we're drifting off our our path, our target path, which means we don't have the observational continuity that's a requirement of this mission. So, just to give you an idea how exact this is, we're traveling about 17,000 miles an hour, and we have to do a, a delta velocity maneuver. We have to actually speed up to make up for this drag that pulls us back. We have to speed up about every three or four weeks. When we do that, we are accelerating the spacecraft by a whopping two to five centimeters per second. That's about one mile an hour. So we're maintaining this satellite going 17,000 miles an hour to within plus or minus a mile or two an hour to maintain our ground track. That's how exact we have to be. And consequently, that's how exact our, our, ground, our tracking systems are that monitor this satellite uh, so that we know where it is and can and figure that out. We have a very great uh, flight dynamics team that does that. Okay, now we're going to talk, and again, ooh and ah about the uh, animations, please. Um, <laughs> now we're going to talk about orbital precession and mean local time. Over the course of a year, the Earth travels around the sun. We get all four seasons. So every quarter of that turn, we just, we just went through 360 days, 365 days, all the way around. Okay, that's what the Earth does, and we want to be taking images throughout that whole period. So this is actually where we are orbiting. Uh, if, here's the shadow. So this is 6 a.m., this is 6 p.m., right at the sun, that's, that's noon. That's solar noon. And so we want to be 10 o'clock. So this is where we always want to be so that we maintain our, our, our imaging continuity. We want to always be at this orientation to the sun. Well, the problem is, after about three months, we're actually imaging something closer to 3 a.m. in the morning. Why? Because the, the, 
the orbit, the Earth is going around the sun, but the orbit doesn't have any inkling to do that. It doesn't know any better. So if we were actually traveling pole to pole, the satellite would do just that. Well, we don't want that. We need the satellite orbit to process around the sun just the same way the Earth processes around the sun so that over a 365 day period of time, we rotate our orbit by 360 degrees so that we stay in synchronization with the Earth. If we don't do that, we don't maintain our mean local time and we don't have our, our, or, our observational continuity for solar illumination. So we're back to our orbit inclination and this should have been the clue to how we actually solve this problem. Because if we were just trying to do this polar sun synchronous orbit, which is what we call these orbits, we're going over the poles, pole to pole, and we're sun synchronous, meaning that we're traveling around the sun at the same way that the Earth is, so that we maintain our mean local time, our, our solar illumination. If we, were just, if, if we weren't trying to do that, we'd go pole to pole and all these lines would be straight up and down. Well, we can't do that. Uh, you, you see these, our inclination is off at an angle, so we're actually traversing the globe at an angle. Why are we doing that? Well, harken back to your high school physics and when your physics teacher gave you a bicycle wheel, spun it around and you're holding on to it and then when you would turn it slightly you'd feel it in part motion and it'd try to pull you around. The force would try to bring you around. That's exactly what we do with a satellite. Instead of flying pole to pole, we actually have a very specific inclination, 98.21 actually, uh, that we uh, fly at and that is just the right angle at a 705 kilometer altitude to make the orbit precess one, about one degree a day so that in 365 days we've rotated all the way around the sun just the way the earth has and we maintain, maintain our mean local time where it should be. This is, always being, this is always changing. Just like our altitude is being pulled down and we're always having to do maintenance, we also have to do maintenance for our inclination because gravitational forces, third body forces from gravity from the sun and from the moon all play havoc with our inclination. And so we, on an annual basis, will do an, an inclination maneuver that maintains our orbit. We, we actually maintain our mean local, or, um, inclination to about... Uh, a few hundredths of a degree. We at 2.98.21 uh, degrees is our target, and we never vary by that by more than, than a tenth of a degree. Excuse me, a, a hundredth of a degree. Okay, so we just talked about the orbit. Now let's talk about my favorite subject, Landsat 5 itself. And what we're going to do is talk about all the spacecraft subsystems because all the Landsat systems and most spacecraft themselves share a lot of the same. Uh, the same subsystems, the same support systems that help the spacecraft operate. And so we're going to talk about the first two, power and thermal. And I'm bringing these two up together because they are the closest example of the autonomic nervous system that we have in our bodies on a spacecraft. There, there are lots of things on the spacecraft that you have to do commanding with to make it happen. Turning on instruments, turning, you know, uh, uh, turning on relays, you know, switching relays, turning on transmitters. Power and thermal are two things you don't want to have to be thinking about. You want the spacecraft to do that itself. So, uh, so we have these systems on board that work fairly autonomously. The solar array, this always is, you always want that pointing at the sun, collecting energy. You don't want the spacecraft to think about it. You don't want your flight operations team to have to think about it. You want that thing to always be collecting power. Uh, and, and when it's collecting power, it's doing two things. It's a, it's creating energy, electricity that runs all the systems on board, but it's also uh, charging these batteries because you saw the, the orbit of the, Earth, the spacecraft, it's, it's in the daylight, you're in the light and you're able to operate things. At night, there's no sunlight, there's no electricity being generated, so the batteries are what carry you through the night. And you want that all to happen autonomously, you don't want to have to think about it at all. Likewise, thermal, same thing. When things get too hot, you want it to cool off automatically. So these louvers, this, is the, this happens to be the power module where these batteries are sitting, are right here in this module. And when they get too hot, these louvers will, you know, will automatically open up and, and radiate the heat out to deep space, cooling and, and allow the cooling of the batteries. Likewise, uh, in areas like on the instrument where, where you have to have a very specific temperature, you don't want it getting too cold. So you have heaters in there that turn on to maintain the temperature as well. They're actually thermostats and they heat up, they turn on the heat when they need to and they turn it off when it gets warm enough. So these are things that are happening all autonomously within the spacecraft. Whenever we have an anomaly, and take my word, we've had 
a few. Uh, the one thing you, the first thing you want to have happen is to ensure that the spacecraft is, is thermally balanced and power positive. Because if you don't have enough power, you'll lose the mission. If you, if you don't have good thermal balance, you'll lose the mission because you know fuel lines will, will rupture, all sorts of things can happen. That's why you make these systems autonomous. You want them to, you know, you want them to operate and save the mission when you can't. Okay, communications. Talking back and forth to the spacecraft. Okay, first of all, this, this happens to be the transponder that's on Landsat 5. Uh, it, it, this is where all the, there are two types of communication that we have with the spacecraft. There's the engineering data, what we call health and safety data. That's all the bits of information. What's this voltage? What's this temperature? What's this current? What's the state of this, this component? That's all the engineering data that we need to get a hold of. And likewise, we need to be able to send commands to it. That's all what we call TTNC. It's the, the tracking data, it, uh, telemetry and commanding. And that's, that's what we use uh, at our mission control center to talk to the satellite and hear back from it to make sure everything's okay. The second part, and, and that's what this does, this transponder is what does that. And it goes through these a couple different antennas here, here and the big one, both can, can handle that data. Then we have the image data, the, 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 the reason we're all there, the, the payload uh, pictures that are being taken, and they go through an entirely different system. Why? Because it takes very little room to uh, data flow to send down all the health and safety, uh, but it takes a lot of bandwidth to send down all this image data. So we have special transmitters for that, and this happens to be what we call a traveling wave tube amplifier, what we, re we refer to as a Tweeta. And uh, the reason I have that picture is because we're going to come back to that tweet a little bit later. But uh, <clears throat> that, that just kind of gives you an idea of what some of the components are. Okay, command and data handling. This is the CPU of the spacecraft. This is the, the brains. This is where the, the motherboard is, where the, where the onboard computer resides, where all the memory management is occurring, and it's where all the command uh, interpretation happens. So when we send a command to the spacecraft, it goes through that the transponder that you saw in the last picture, and then is sent to the OBC, the onboard computer, where it interprets that command and acts on it. That command could be turn on a receiver, it could be turn on an instrument, it could be you know rotate the spacecraft or fire the thrusters. Whatever those commands are, they go through the onboard computer, and the onboard computer then sends those commands somewhere else and, and, and activates the, those uh, and acts on those commands. Now. I've got this picture here too because one of the other things we have on Landsat 5 is the ability, we don't have the ability to record the, <clears throat> excuse me, we don't have the ability to record image data, but we can record that engineering data. Why? Because we don't see the spacecraft very often, and I'll talk about that a little bit later, but we always want to know what was happening when we weren't seeing, looking at the spacecraft. So we need to record that data, and this is, that's what this is. This is, this is actually a tape recorder. Now let me make sure it's clear what, how important that is and how remarkable it is. A tape recorder that was built in 1970 that has recorded and played back more than 50,000 times. We've got two of them. Both have recorded and played back probably more than 50,000 times. Our lead engineer on the mission considers this to be one of the most amazing parts of the spacecraft, actually, because this was built when 8-track tapes were king. <laughs> and it still operates and is sending in his recording data in that we play back every day. I guarantee you, well, let's see, it's a little afternoon. We probably just had a pass at the, our primary ground center, ground station, and one of these recorders just played back its contents from the previous orbit. That's, I mean, that happens every day, um, every time we have contact with it. So it's really quite amazing. Oh, what was that? No, it doesn't record sound. Uh, what it records is what we refer to as telemetry, engineering data, voltages, temperatures, uh, configurations of, of different components, uh, uh, anything that has to do with the spacecraft. There are actually 3,600 different types of information that get downlinked at um, every 16 seconds. In fact, some are, they, and are, there are different data rates. We only need to see a temperature once every 16 seconds because things change slowly. Our gyro data, on the other hand, that's, that's what we use, and actually we're about to talk about gyros. Gyros are what tell, tell us the attitude of the spacecraft and the motion of the spacecraft. That we actually get uh, 10 times a second, or 8 times a second, 8 hertz. <clears throat> so, so it just changes by that, but all that, it, that's the kind of data that's coming down to us. All, it's being recorded all the time. We receive it real time when we're seeing the spacecraft, and we also then play back the recorded data that was taken, that, that was recorded while we weren't looking at the spacecraft. 
And we'll talk about that actually coming up. So the attitude control system. One of my favorite parts, because it's actually, th this is where the diving catches are made. You, uh, when the problem happens on the spacecraft, typically it's an attitude issue that's got to be resolved. And so they're a lot of fun to work with. So let's get right to some of these components. Uh, first thing I'm going to show you here, I'm not going to talk about everything, but the one thing I'm going to talk about is the star tracker. And the reason I like this is because if you, if you want to really see that the more things change, the more things stay the same, we use celestial navigation to know where the spacecraft's pointing. So much like the ancient mariners of Greece looked up the stars and said, ah, North Star, I know where I am. We look at stars to figure out where we are. Uh, not necessarily where we are in the orbit, but how we're pointing it. We use it for attitude control. So what that star tracker does is it looks, and, and actually these are, we have two of them, one here and one here. These are looking out to deep space they're looking for stars that they can recognize. And when they see a star, they say, ah, I see that star and I see exactly where it is in relation to me. And then through some mathematical gyrations, we'll, we'll figure out this is where I'm pointing. That becomes truth for the spacecraft. The spacecraft doesn't know where it is. It's got to figure this out from external sources. And the external source for attitude is the stars, are the stars. And so we, we see a star, we shoot it, we know where it is. Uh, don't shoot it literally, but yeah. <laughs> We know where that star is, and then we know where we're pointing. That becomes truth. That's, that's where we're pointing. And then the star goes away. Well, what do we do then? That's where these gyros come into play. We have three of them on board. And what they do is they don't know where we are, but they know what the spacecraft's doing in body rates. We have, it takes three axes, and it will say, it will know if we're moving on any of those axes. It's what we call body rates. And so if the spacecraft moves at all, those gyros will sense it. They'll tell that OBC and say, hey, we're, we're, we're turning where we shouldn't be turning. The OBC will say, well, that's not good. Let's call our reaction control wheels, which are these spinning masses, and command those to offset whatever that motion is that we don't want and sta stabilize the spacecraft. <coughs> so uh, then we have magnetic torque rods and finer sen sun sensors that we aren't going to talk about because what we're going to talk about right now is just how accurate this system actually is that was, that was designed and built in the 70s. I am using two hands and I'm holding this pointer as still as I can after having two cups of coffee. <laughs> that right there is probably a thousand times, no lie, a thousand times or maybe more less accurate than that 4,500 pound spacecraft has to be pointing at going 17,000 miles an hour, 705 kilometers up in space. We measure the, the pointing error of that spacecraft in hundreds of degrees. I mean, and that what you're seeing right there is probably a couple degrees at least. And so it, it's, it's really mind boggling that you can take this 4,500 pound spacecraft with moving parts on it, with arrays that are spinning and looking and tracking the earth, with stars coming and going, and it takes all that and figures out exactly where it needs to point and points in that direction. There's a lot behind this that I'm not going into in terms of ephemeris and all these good things, but the fact is it's, it's truly one of the remarkable technology feats, I think, for these, these missions is just how accurate you have to be. And if you want to put that in real world perspective, think of the last time you took a picture with your camera phone and it was blurry. And yet you're holding on to it. This is flying at 17,000 miles an hour way up in space and, and, and it was built in the 70s. So it's really pretty remarkable. I'm thrilled, with, thrilled about it. You can't tell, if you can't tell, I'm excited about this mission. <laughs> Propulsion. Okay, this is the reason we're here still. We could have everything work perfectly throughout the entire mission, but as I mentioned earlier in the talk, fuel is a consumable on board. We only launch with so much of it, and when it's gone, it's gone. Or, in this case, not. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, what we have in the back of the spacecraft, you don't see in this picture, this is where, where the business end of the jets are, the, uh, what we call REMS, rocket engine mo uh, modules. And they are what that spit out the fuel back this way, propel us forward, so that we can replace that energy that got lost due to drag. Well, Landsat 5 is what we call a multi-mission multi, uh, multi spacecraft bus. And so it was launched, it was designed with these three tanks in mind. One, two, three. These are small tanks, hold about 167 kilograms of fuel between them. And they are, they are what you would normally launch a spacecraft with. Landsat 4 and 5, though, were very unique because they were launched with this auxiliary fuel tank. Why? Because back then in the late 70s, early 80s, when this mission was being, concept was being developed, there was planned to be a polar orbiting shuttle. 
a shuttle that doesn't fly out of Kennedy, but flies out of Vandenberg Air Force Base in, in California, and would, instead of flying east to west, or west to east, I guess I would say, that away, um, would actually fly north to south in a polar orbit. And the idea was that when Landsat 5 got old and tired 20 years ago, it could lower itself, it'd use that extra fuel tank to lower itself down from 705 kilometers where Landsat 5 flies every day, down to 400 kilometers, about 250 miles, where the shuttle would be flying. The shuttle would bring out its grappling hook, it'd grab it, and there are actually power technics on the solar array drive and on this big boom for the antenna boom that would have jettisoned, would, would have cut the, uh, the cords and jettisoned those off once they got collected by the, by the shuttle. Those pyrotechnics are still on here. Interestingly enough, when we decommissioned Landsat 4, we thought, well, let's break that all apart. We can't do it. The, the only way that can work is you have to be, have an umbilical hooked up. You need an, an astronaut to plug in and send the commands to, to have that happen. You can't do it from the ground. So that's a little bit of history on, on, on these missions and, and what might have been with a little bit different shuttle program. But be as it may, this big fuel tank, because of the fact it wasn't used to lower our orbit by 300 kilometers, we've been able to use that over the years to continually manage our altitude and our inclination to make, to make sure that we have good observational continuity throughout all these years. Okay, so we've talked about Landsat 5 and all the systems that go into making it operate. You know, the power, thermal, communications, command and data handling, the brains of it, the propulsion, and the attitude control. These are all here. They're all very important. You couldn't run the mission without it, but you wouldn't want a mission without the payloads. So let's talk a little bit about the payloads. First one we're going to talk about is the heritage. The multispectral scanner. This is the heritage of the mission because a multispectral scanner was flown not only on Landsat 5, but on 4, 3, 2, and 1. So what that meant is that if nothing else worked on the spacecraft, you would be able to have observational continuity from, the, from Landsat 5 back to Landsat 1, which is great. That's important. But it's also the old technology, uh, and, and the new kid on the block was the thematic mapper. And this has been the workhorse of this mission from day one up till 2011. <clears throat> it collects more bands. It collects it more accurately with higher radiometric fidelity, higher spectral uh, resolution. Uh, really a great instrument. So you might ask, Steve, why do we have both of these on the same mission? Well, observational continuity, it's always got to be there. And Landsat and the multispectral uh, scanner, MSS, is the heritage. The thematic mapper is the future. You need to be able to cross-calibrate those two so that pictures that you take with the thematic mapper can be compared to pictures taken with the multispectral uh, scanner back to 72. So by flying them on the same satellite, you could cross calibrate. They kept, they're flying over the same piece of earth, looking through the same atmosphere at the same field and, and measuring the same reflectance off that field. And so the radiometric scientists could take that information from both those sensors and come up with a cross calibration. So that's, that's why you fly them both at the same time. So uh, I want to give you a sense of scale here. That is the thematic mapper. And that's a guy that's kind of hard to see on the screen, but that's a guy there. Uh, pretending to work on it. <clears throat> this is just before it was integrated with the spacecraft. So let's, let's put that in perspective. That, this right here is an Earth shield that is right here. That's, this is the guy right here is standing next to this little thing right here. Multispectral scanner, it happens to be right up here, and then the whole bus. On your way home tonight, if you see a, a Humvee, an H2 Humvee, that's about the size of the spacecraft, not counting the boom going up or the, the array going out. That's just the, the body of it. So it's, it's, a, it's a big, big payload, about 4,500 pounds. Okay, now moving right along. Yeah, we're running low on time, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start zooming through a few of these really quickly. Space segment, just want to tell you really quickly how we communicate with the spacecraft. Here is the control center for, for the, space, for the uh, mission. Uh, these are actually real-time ops guys. These are the engineers. Here's a looky-loo. This was actually taken just a, this was taken just a couple weeks ago during one of our maneuvers uh, that, we're, that we're executing right at that time. So we're located in, uh, that mission operations center is located in Columbia, Maryland, just about 20 miles north of here. We need the Aeros Data Center, Earth Resources Observation Center, out in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, to actually uh, be the ground station for us, though. So we have the spacecraft sending data 
two arrows that gets transmitted over by a ground network to our ground control center who can then send commands back and so that's a two-way street. When we're not flying over lands, over one of our ground stations, we can do it via TDRS. TDRS is a set of, of, of satellites flying in geosynchronous orbit 36,000 kilometers up in space and they are, uh, uh, they act as a data relay for us. They have their own, they have their own ground station located in uh, White Sands, New Mexico and what we can do is send data from our spacecraft to their spacecraft to their ground and over across and that provides us with the ability to communicate anywhere around the globe with the spacecraft which with an old mission like this it's important that we have that communications capability okay so that and that gives you the idea that's everything that we've got i'm kind of zooming through here now that's all the engineering data that's how we handle the command control telemetry the engineering information but then there's all that science that science data that payload data well that can go directly to the ground station via uh, what's called an X-band, a, a direct link to the ground. But we also have international cooperators all around the globe. This happens to be a station located in Bangkok, Thailand, one of the older international cooperators we have. But this, we're using them as the, as the example of the international cooperation that we've had with this mission really since its inception. And so when we are flying, not over the U.S., but when we're flying over, and again, ooh and ah on the, on the animations, uh, when we're flying over Southeast Asia, Thailand, you know, a station in Bangkok, Thailand, one in uh, near Jakarta, Indonesia, Australia, Japan, China. They all have ground stations that receive data from Landsat 5 or have received data from Landsat 5. And then when they use it for themselves uh, in their local applications, but then they send the data back to the U.S. Uh, where Aeros can store it. So we maintain a global archive of all the data collected by Landsat, which is freely available to you all. Okay, when we're not flying over a ground station somewhere, we also had the ability to use TDRS, again, to do those same links so that between all the various different ways, we were able to collect data around the world because this is a global survey mission. This isn't a U.S. mission. This is a global survey mission, and it takes a village to make it all happen. Okay, very quickly through the ground segment, uh, real-time ops, flight dynamics, mission planning, ops engineering. The real-time guys, these two guys right here, they're the ones actually with their hands on the, on the keyboard sending commands seeing the telemetry coming down in real time and saying everything's okay or yeah, things aren't right. But they're the ones doing that, that interaction, that interactive interaction with, with uh, the spacecraft. Uh, the flight dynamics and mission planning are the guys who figure out where it's been, where it's going, and what it's got to do. Ops engineering, they're the guys who take the long view. They don't look just at what's happening today. They looked at what's happened in the past, trend it forward to figure out what's going to happen in the future and hopefully predict good things and when they, when they predict bad things, start working ahead of time on mitigations to make sure that we don't lose the mission due to something that we could have predicted, prevented, or mitigated. Okay, payload operations, nothing to do with space flight, so I'm going to ignore this pretty much other than to say, you know, put in a plug for Eros, the USGS station out in Sioux Falls that not only does our ground station work, but does the data processing, archiving, and distribution, again, free to you on the web. Landsat Ground Network and the International Cooperators. That's where all the, all the data goes. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on mission planning other than to say what we need to do, because we can't image everywhere all the time, we have to decide where the best places are to collect. The, there are about 850 land scenes that we go over every day, and we only really can collect about 300 or 350, depending on the orbit and the cycle day. And so we have to decide, of those 850, what are the 300 or so that we want to collect? Well, the first thing you can do is knock out about 200 of them because depending on the time of year, it's dark at one of the two poles. So that's, that's data that we're not collecting. Uh, then the, the next big discriminator is clouds. We're not cloud sat, we're not water sat, we're land sat. And, and as such, we only want to get scenes that show land. And so we start knocking out cloudy scenes. Well, how do you do that? The U.S. government has a little bit of everything and they have a National Center for Environmental Prediction where we can get the cloud cover predicts for the next 24 hours and beyond and more and as importantly what are what's the cloud climatology for that area so say we have a scene that's got 30 percent cloud cover do we want to take it or don't we well if it's over phoenix arizona or let's take a better place let's take let's take the sahara desert and it's 30 percent cloud cover climatology would say yeah that's not a good bet because it's always going to be clear there if you've got a scene that's predicted to be 30 percent cloud cover don't waste your time with it there'll be a there'll be a clear scene coming up next time Likewise, if you're over Amazonia and it says 30% cloud cover, well, that's typically socked in constantly. It's really hard. We bang on that all the time to get a few pixels of clear data. So if you had a scene that was predicted with 30% cloud cover, 
you throw a lot of resources at making sure you tried to collect that scene. And that's what these mission planners do is they, they take all this various information about where the satellite's going to be, what the predictions are, what we've collected in the past, what we want for the future, and come up with an activity list that says, at, at, for this particular time, this is the work that we're going to be doing. And it creates this list that then goes to the real-time operators who will take that, turn it into a command load that goes up to the spacecraft. And now the spacecraft has a spinning clock. Everything on the spacecraft runs on time, and uh, unlike the trains. And, the, and when, the, when it hits a certain time, a command will go off. And it will just go through that activity list, and when it hits the correct time, the command will fire. And it might be image here, don't image there, transmit to the ground here, don't transmit to the ground there. Okay, ops engineering. I'm just going to say these again. These are the people who do all that work to make sure the spacecraft keeps running. On on non L5 missions, you sit back and look pretty. On on Landsat 5, the engineers have done yeoman's work to make the spacecraft run, run 28 years, and it's really a testament to their their ingenuity that that we still have a mission. Okay, so this I'm going to really zoom through, but it uh, but it tells the tale of what's broken, and. <laughs> And, and I could spend another hour here easily on this. But just to let you know, red means something broke permanently. White, like in 85, something broke, but there was redundancy. And green means nothing happened to break that year. So I'm just going to slowly or quickly ride through this. And you'll see that during the beginning part of the, of the mission, things ran pretty well. I will mention back down in 92, we lost the second of our two amplifiers that allow us to send data through teeters to the ground, the, the image data. So all of a sudden, back starting in 92, eight years after the mission started, and, and a lot of years after the, and its uh, design life ended, we were no longer able to image data when we weren't over ground station. We couldn't send data from our, from our antenna to, to Tedris up in space down to the ground. We had to be over a ground station. That's a, that was a key loss at that point. MSS. We lost that in 1995. Not a big deal for us because we'd already done that cross calibration. It was a bigger deal for the international cooperators who, who still were using it, but actually, in a way, it was a gift to them because that forced the remainder over that the few that were remaining on a multispectral scanner over to the thematic mapper, which is a better instrument for everyone. Okay, then we go through the good years. Green, 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 green. I'll mention 2001 because that's when the U.S. Geological Survey took over operational responsibility for Landsat. Five. We'd already taken over Landsat 7, but this is when I became the mission director, the flight systems manager for, for Landsat 5. I already was that for Landsat 7. 02 was a bad year. We, had, we, we lost some capability. 3, 4, you know, okay, the, the point I want to make for this decade, I'm just going to kind of scroll through because we don't have much time, but what I want you to see is that the screen gets a little busier in the last decade. It's, it was a, uh, this was the third decade of operation for a three-year design life mission, and, and it was starting to uh, show its age. Okay, and we're stopping 2012. Okay, a couple things I want to show real quickly. We, uh, back in 06, 05, we lost both solar array drives. That's, that's, those are the drives that keep the spacecraft pointing at the sun so we get power. As I said, power is king. We need to have power where we've got problems. Likewise, we need to be able to get data to the ground. We'd already lost through all these other little places all the means of getting data to the ground except for our, our X-band Tweety, that picture I showed you. We lost the pr first one in 87 when Reagan was still president. And we lost the second in, in, in 06. We, we lost the second one. But through a lot of engineering fortitude, came up with a way to turn it on. And now we're going to talk briefly about both those because those are key points. But the bottom line is, in the end of 2012, and the graphic kind of went off here, but it's, yeah, and you can't read it because it's not there, but we lost a gyro. We launched with three gyros. It takes two to operate the mission. We can, seven, the 705 orbit regime is very popular for Earth remote sensing. We could not fail in that orbit. When we lost that gyro, we lost a key redundancy in the spacecraft that if we lost another, another gyro, we would go spinning out of control in place at 705 and become a hazard to the other satellites. And so in November of last year, November 4th, this anomaly happened. We gave up trying to save it about two weeks later because we recognized the, the symptoms and knew that it was gone. And so we began the decommissioning process, which started with the final image being collected by, uh, by the instruments back on, on the 6th of January of this year. 
And on the 15th of this year, we began the decommissioning process of lowering the satellite out of 705 before we had another failure that we could not control the satellite. So the reason I brought up the, the solar ray drive and the Tweeta is I want to just talk real briefly, and I mean real briefly, about, uh, about our diving catches that engineering made. So we had the solar ray drive. The solar ray, ooh. Um, <clears throat> the solar ray is tracking the sun, and so as the spacecraft goes around the Earth, that arrow represents the spacecraft pointing at the ground at Nader to take those pictures. This, the the uh, array is constantly going around the sun, uh, going around the uh, spacecraft, pointing at the sun all the time, so that when we're in daylight, we are collecting energy all the way through. Because if you think of the way the shadow is, we only have about 33 minutes of time when we're not actually in the sun. Well, when those arrays broke, we became fixed. So now, if you see that, the array is no longer turning. We stuck it at, sol at, at spacecraft noon, at solar noon. That meant that the only time we were actually collecting full power was once in orbit when we were at the equator. So what that meant is when we're at the poles now, both at North and South Pole, we're edge on, we're not collecting any power. That lengthened the night very a long way, and we already had battery issues that I didn't show you about later, uh, before, but so this was a real problem for us. This is the place where we started getting enough light on the uh, array that we were actually generating power that could help the spacecraft. That's where it used to be. So we lost a lot of time there, and likewise in the southern hemisphere, same thing. We, we lost a lot of opportunity to collect power and at the same time, lengthened the, our spacecraft night, if you will, the time when we had to rely on the batteries. Really bad. The only time we were collecting full power was in the middle. So what we came up with as a unique approach is we actually track the sun and we pitch the spacecraft. We can't move the array, so we move the spacecraft. So we point at the sun, we go to Nader to image during the day, then when we're done imaging, we twist the spacecraft again and collect some more sun. Ingenious idea that that nobody's ever done. And, and so we're, we're pretty darn proud of that. And so that's, we, we start collecting sun much earlier in the orbit. And actually, we went, we, where we, as we had lost about 12 minutes of, of charge time and added 12 minutes tonight on the spacecraft, we ended up with only about a two minute loss. When by the time we did this, we, we only lost two minutes and we actually maintained the full functional capability of the spacecraft, even though we had a mission ending failure. I mean, any other mission would have said, okay, that's it. But because Landsat 8 was delayed in being built, we, USGS wanted to find a way to keep this spacecraft flying, and we found it. Okay, then there was the communications. And I'll just say this was our Apollo 13 moment. In, two, in 06, this failed. It would no longer fire. When you turn it on, it blew a breaker. Each and every time, you turn it on, blow a breaker. We did the, if you watch the Apollo 13 movie, uh, when they're coming back from the moon and they're trying to repower the, uh, the uh, command module and they were trying different ways to turn it on so they wouldn't blow the breaker. That's exactly what we did with the Tweeta. We, we started experimenting with different ways to turn it on. Turn it on with no modulation. Turn it on with the, with the frequency amp turned off. All these different things that we did until we found the, the order to turn things on, which normally everything turned on. What we did was start with everything off and turn on individual components so that it would fire without failing. We did that, and it lasted another almost four years after coming up with that fix, <laughs> making it, it lasted 23 years. The redundant tweet, the first one lasted three years, the redundant lasted uh, 23 years. So for that, and this is hanging up in my office actually, <laughs> little plug, and if I, I can't read it on here, I'll try to read it here. Uh, for dedicated efforts in recovering Landsat 5 from two potentially mission-ending hardware anomalies, and restoring the mission to full operations. This was uh, given to the uh, to our team for for recovering the satellite back in 06. This is a international award from the Space Ops uh, group. So we're very proud of that. Okay, so getting to the end here. What makes us amazing? Keep in mind everything I've talked about here, it was a three year design life for a design that was from the 70s. It lasted 29 years. In that time, we orbited the Earth 153,000 times. It was design life was 15,000 orbits. A couple things to think about when that 150,000, over 150,000. Every orbit, we, we uh, run, we uh, charge the battery up during the daylight and we discharge it at night and charge it back again 14 times a day for, for what was 10,538 days of operation. Imagine your chick or lady chick in your bathroom, which uses the same battery technology, an ICAD battery, 
charging it and recharging it and you're running it down and charging it again 150,000 times. That's what this ba these batteries have done. Most of them, that, they're not all there now. Right? You know, and we, we passed that pretty quickly too. But the fact is, it's still operating to this day. Those batteries right now, well, they're probably at night, but they, during the daytime they're charging, at night they're discharging. So, 200, uh, over 2.6 million images, 80 billion square kilometers of the Earth, which I forgot how many times around that. I don't know if I wrote it down, but it's imaging the entire landmass of the Earth many, many times, 500 sometimes, I believe. Uh, now, here's the thing I'm particularly proud of. Over almost half the images, about 47 or 48 percent of all the images collected by Landsat 5 in 29 years were collected in the last decade. That's in this time when all those lights, all, everything was coming up, everything was coming apart. That's still when the, the, it was the most prolific time for the spacecraft collecting imagery. Why? Because the USGS made a keen effort in its international cooperation. We couldn't send, get data through TDRS. We, you know, we had to use our international partners to collect the imagery. And, and USGS made strong strides with that whole community. And we ended up with a lot of different stations around the globe collecting imagery. And we you know, squeezed you know, blood from that rock and, and collected all those images and collected almost half the images of the entire mission in the last decade. So we're, we're quite proud of that. Um, and 38 different receiving stations in those 29 years in 22 different countries. Uh, it's simply remarkable. And for that, there we go. <laughs> we just, it's official. We, we are the longest operating Earth remote sensing mission ever launched by mankind, something we take extreme pride at because it was not an easy feat to accomplish. It took dedicated efforts by some really, really, thank God, smarter people than me to, to make this all happen. And, and I am so proud to be part of the team that's, that's accomplished this because it's been a feat not only for our country but for the world with all it's accomplished. And before we end, which I think we're going to have questions, I want to just acknowledge that we have a couple people from our flight operations team. We have the flight systems manager who sat down somewhere. Stand up there, Bob. And, and next to him is Jeff Devine, the lead engineer for the mission. I get, I get to stand up here and take all the glory. They get all the credit. These are the guys who actually make it happen, and I, I, they're absolutely some of my best friends. Uh, we worked together for years and years, and, and uh, thank them very much for everything they've done with us. So with that... definitely can answer some questions and we've got one down here. Steve, what, what's the composition of the fuel you're trying to dump from the five birds? What's the kind of fuel that we're trying to dump from the spacecraft? It's, it's, it has hydrazine in it. It's a monopropellant, uh, nitrogen, hydrogen, uh, N, N4, I don't, I've, I've forgotten it now, but uh, N4, N3, okay, yeah, thanks. Uh, it's uh, hydrazine fuel, monopropellant. So the, the great thing about that is it doesn't take two different fuels, a, a, um, a catalyst in, in the fuel to make it work. You don't need an oxidizer as well as a fuel. So it's, it's easier to work with. Nothing you want to uh, touch with your hands. Uh, it's very caustic. And, uh, and actually, NASA has been working very hard on coming up with greener fuels to use in spacecraft because uh, that's one of the things, that's one of the reasons why we need to empty those tanks out before it re-enters the atmosphere because you just don't want that stuff flying around. I don't, I don't think it's a big deal, you know, because most of it I think would burn up. But as part of the effort to maintain, our, 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 we have very specific rules on our decommissioning. Uh, and one of them is, you know, well, the three are, remove chemical sources of power, energy, kinetic, and electrical. And the, all this decommissioning, these decommissioning burns are to do that first one, remove the chemical energy. Any other questions? So the reason that the, the mission was so long-lived, it, it had this system built in to be able to drop down the space shuttle for servicing. That's, you had this With, okay. surplus of fuel. That's a bit of a tr trick question. Okay. Absol <laughs> absolutely, yeah, absolutely, it could not have survived as long as it did without the fuel to maintain the orbit so we had the observational continuity. However, there have been numerous mission ending failures that have occurred along the way that would have ended the mission as well had it not been for operational workarounds. And this is something NASA is actually looking at, is the fact that there's a design life that, that spacecraft are built to, but then there's an operational workaround that's, that's the, the 
wild card in the process of are there errors that can occur that you can compensate for in some way? And Landsat 5, just based on the way it was built, had lots of ways to do that that a lot of other satellites wouldn't have. Um, and so we were just very fortunate but to have the fuel and to have the, the means at our disposal to do those diving catches. Me too. You take the lens, you look out, you're looking at the stars. You can, the, the, the satellite can calculate where it is from looking at one star? Oh, excellent question. No. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, how does that work? So, there's a couple things I didn't talk about. This, this, you're supposed to repeat the question. Oh, I'm sorry. Let me repeat that question. I did not say that. Uh, okay, I apologize. Last question was, was fuel the only in indicator of, of getting us to as long as we were? Sorry, paraphrasing. But the, uh, the question just asked is, uh, explain a little, with a little better detail the, the way that we maintain attitude control. Well, the satellites going around the Earth, pitching around the Earth, it doesn't actually know the Earth is there. It just knows that there's some gravitational force keeping it from flying straight. It keeps on falling around the Earth. At, because we keep the speed up so it never falls into the earth, it always, only falls around it. And we track where that is by something called ephemeris, that we track the satellite every day, we take that, that definitive ephemeris and predict out into the future where the satellite will be. We then tell the satellite, this is where you're going to be. Then we also load up a star catalog that says, for where you're going to be, these are the stars you should be seeing. <clears throat> it then, uh, it actually uses a, something, a Coleman filter, and it... Uh, it takes stars, and it has to take more than one. It takes a few stars, only one at a time, and it looks at an XY, uh, uh, in an XY coordinate system, and it converts. And, and we have very specific. In fact, actually, I uh, don't have the picture anymore, but we do we do all sorts of very fine measurements to know exactly where that satellite, where that star tracker is pointing in relation to the body of the spacecraft. There are different coordinate systems. There's like three or four coordinate systems on a spacecraft. You know, the, you have your navigation, you have your instrument coordinate system. There's, and so it, the, the gymnastics of the mathematics is taking that two-dimensional location of that, of that star and deducing what the attitude of the spacecraft is. But then over time, it takes additional stars, and that's a refining model. And so it takes, you know, depending on where you're starting from, if you have to reset the Coleman filter versus restart it, uh, it will determine how long it actually takes to collect enough information that it, you, you're over time refining, refining, refining that solution until you have the accuracy that we need. You don't get it from the first star. That's a very good observation. You get it over time through multiple collects, uh, star identifications and, and sightings as well as from the fine sun sensor, which, which actually sits on the back of the spacecraft and at the South Pole looks back at the sun, and we actually get some, um, some positioning information from that as well. Is that older technology as in, does Landsat 8 still do that, or is, are they using GPS? Okay, so the question is, uh, is Landsat 8 using the same technology as Landsat 5? Excellent question, and yes and no. There's a little mixture there of what, with what you're asking because GPS takes care of part of it, but it doesn't take care of all of it. GPS replaces the need for us to track the satellite the day before, figure out where it's been so we can predict where it's going. The ephemeris, keep in mind, what that's doing is it's describing the arc of the spacecraft around so it knows where it is in orbit, so it knows what its pitch angle needs to be to stay pointing at the center of the Earth for, for nadir picture taking. That's what the GPS replaces. On Landsat 8 has GPS. It uses it to replace our need to track the satellite and figure out where it is around the Earth. GPS is telling, that, uh, telling us that in real time on Landsat 8. Landsat 5 didn't have that. Well, it had it, but it never worked. It, Landsat 5 was actually launched with a GPS. The flight software didn't work on it. There wasn't really a constellation at that time anyway. It was going to be built while Landsat 5 was being built. And, uh, but the, that receiver never worked, so we never used GPS. Whenever, we always just track the satellite, come up with this predicted ephemeris, put it on board, spacecraft looks at stars and says, uh, based on where I am, based on this ephemeris, I know where I'm pointing. Likewise, with Landsat 8, it doesn't need that file to be sent up. It uses the GPS, but it also has star trackers because you still need that truth. You need a celestial truth of where it is. Even Landsat 7 doesn't use a star tracker. It uses a, 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 what's called a slit sensor, but does the same thing. It looks for stars, and based on finding the stars, and uh, we'll determine that helps it figure out where it's pointing based on its predicted ephemeris. So, like, how 
many satellites are involved in the total GPS system? Oh, now you're getting out of my comfort zone, but there are, I believe, 24 satellites in operation for GPS, and they have a few spares so and on orbit. No more than your car's doing to get you here. <laughs> oh, except for the elevation part. <laughs> uh, we're, we're running out of time. One more question. Are all of your land satellites at the same altitude? Ah, excellent question. You saw that we had the World Reference System 2. That infers that there was a one, and there was. Landsats one, two, and three, Earth's, the Earth sensors, the Earth Resource Technology satellites, they actually flew at 933 kilometers because there was no plan for them to come down. That's a really benign area up there. The higher you are, the less atmospheric drag, so the, the less impact uh, in, in work to keep it flying. That flew on WRS. It's kind of like World War I, World War II. You didn't call it World War I until there was a two. Worldwide reference system, you didn't have a two you didn't have a one until you needed a two. So the first three satellites all flew in WRS. The uh, Landsat's four and up fly in WRS two, as do many NASA missions now. Uh, uh, that, that constellation, we call it the AM and PM constellation, those that cross the equator in the morning, those that cross in the afternoon, the EOS missions, they all follow that same ground track that was developed for Landsat back in the 70s. Yes, sir. Nope, that, that was the last one to use it. Absolutely. The, the question was, was MSS ever flown after Landsat 5? And the answer is no. Landsat uh, 7 actually used what we call the enhanced thematic mapper. Basically the same thematic mapper that was flown for 5 and 4, but with extra calibration capabilities so that uh, we could get even better radiometry. And in fact, actually, this is one of the great you know, stories of the program, the higher fidelity of Landsat 7 data was used to better calibrate the Landsat 5. So Landsat 7 actually made the Landsat 5 archive, 30-year archive, even more valuable by allowing the radiometric engineers to refine the, uh, uh, the, uh, the products, uh, the product accuracy. Yeah, I'm I sorry. need to do this. I, I, I can stand around out here, too. I, know, <laughs> I was going to say, I'm sure he could entertain some questions as we're um, powering down. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, and thank you on behalf of uh, Bob White and Jeff Devine. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.